hello again. Do you remember me? <laughs> <laughs> Alfil Dagrell was a con let's do this first. Alfil Dagrell was a contemporary of August Strindberg and Henry Gibson. She wrote both plays and prose fiction, but is mainly known as a playwright who was quite successful in Scandinavian theatres in the 1880s. Her play, Reddad, Saved in English, became her breakthrough. It was first staged at the Royal Dramatic Theatre in Stockholm in, 19, sorry, in 1882 and published in 1883. Reddad criticizes marriage and is considered one of the first expressions of the Swedish modern breakthrough naturalism and also part of an early feministic movement at the theatres in the wake of Henrik Ibsen's A Doll's House. In the last act of Reddad, the usually quiet and subservient young wife Viola speaks her true mind in a scene of revelation. She rants about her husband's treatment of her and fully reveals her suffering and frustration. She blames not only her husband, but also her mother-in-law for her miserable marriage and the maltreatment of her. Previous to her outburst, she has learned that a friend of her mother's has given her a large sum of money as a gift, and also that her husband, Oscar, has embezzled money from the bank where, she works, where he works and now risks going to jail. Viola's mother-in-law tries to persuade Viola to give the gift of money to her husband to help him cover his crime, but Viola refuses. She finds that finally her time has come. With Oscar in jail, convicted of a serious crime, she would finally have the opportunity to escape her unhappy marriage with the custody of her son. With the gift of money, she also had an, in, an initial capital to start a new life. This scene recalls Nora's exit in Henrik Ibsen's A Doll's House. But Viola, leaving her marriage after having scolded her husband and mother-in-law with the custody of her son and with enough money to start a new independent life, strikes me <coughs> as much more radical than Nora's exit without her children and without any money. But the prospect of such an ending is soon dashed. In a sudden turn of the plot, Viola's little son dies in a fit of croup. In the high-strung melodramatic final scene, which takes place late in the evening, Viola appears all dressed in black and with a black veil covering her face. She signs over her gift of money to her husband then she leaves the house in despair with her dead son in her arms. When first reading the play, I found this ending quite bizarre, surprising and disappointing. The retreat from the expectations of Viola's independent future was puzzling. Why doesn't the girl let Viola happily escape her marriage? Why does she dash the expectations that she builds up in the revelation scene? Would it have been too bold an ending? The fate of Viola did not comply with what I had learned about Scandinavian modern breakthrough plays, debating marriage, and definitely not with the play contributing to a first wave of feminism at the Swedish theatres. Breaches of expectations that promise success for the subordinated but rebellious protagonist recur in Alfred Dagred's plays and also in the plays by her contemporary female playwrights criticizing marriage. Their critique of marriage is equipped with an escape route. Their plays are cautious, and yet there is a strong urge to say it all, to reveal the truths about women's situations in marriage and in the family. I claim that the vacillation between self-censoring and exposure of intimacy shapes the rhetoric of the early naturalistic plays by Swedish female playwrights. In this keynote, I will use Agrell's Reddad as an example and take the point of departure in Helen Freshwater's inclusive definition of censorship and Toril Moy's ideas on a caring, loving reading mood from her work, Revolution of the Ordinary. I will then attend to a great censorious situation of late 19th century Sweden 
and show the vacillating rhetoric of censoring and exposure in Agrell's Reddad. Furthermore, I will propose a relational experiential reading strategy to expose expressions of women's intimate experiences. This means a reading against the grain of temporal layers of repression and silencing in literary history and, and analy analytic methods and a loving, caring reading mood in complicity with the author and the concern of the text. Finally, I will also contextualize this complicit, <coughs> complicit reading strategy into a transnational context. Instead of starting in a set definition, Helen Freshwater proposes an inclusive model of censorship that is based on the responsiveness to the experience of being censored. Also, it should reflect the socio-historical specificity of instances of control, conditioning, or silencing. And furthermore, distinguish between different kinds of censorship, such as critical exclusion, or authoritarian intervention, and institutional inter in interference. Freshwater furthermore underlines the temporal aspect of censorship, stating that censorious events are not singular but part in a chain of events and interactions with censorious agents. This quality opens doors for, for subversive responsive to censorship. The requirement of reiteration for repression, silencing and controlling to keep its force offers a possibility of re renegotiation. Freshwater suggests that another possibility of subversive responses lies in Judith Butler's proposal that censors are compelled to restage the very utterances they seek to banish from public life, thus conducting a performative contradiction. Consequently, censorship may heighten an awareness of excluded material, which may generate complicit reading audiences who are aware of the dual structure of the censored text. At the bottom of Freshwater's plea for censorship as a heterogeneous category is an ethical stance. To suggest that individuals with experience of censorship did not encounter such a thing because their experience does not correspond to, to a predefined category would reinscribe the original act of exclusion and silencing. What Freshwater's waters models lacks is an understanding of the fact that censorious events in the same time and, and space affects and thus are experienced differently by individuals depending on their social and cultural position. As Pierre Bourdieu has proposed, the way in which the individual author deals with normative codes attaches her to a specific position in the cultural field and are decisive for how the individual author, no, uh, uh, to a specific, sorry, a specific position in a cultural field. Turning Bourdieu's position around, specific position in a cultural field are decisive for how the individual author can relate to external regulations. These positions are structured by intersections of gender, class, age, ethnicity, sexual preference, etc. Furthermore, the long-term historical temporality of censorious forces and the loyalty and connections between censorious agents through history needs to be further stressed. When dealing with women's writing in history, exclusionary and silencing processes in layers of established historiography, canonization and scholarly methods of literary an analysis need scrutinizing and be complemented by alternatives. Tori Moy criticizes the hegemonic position of the hermeneutics of suspicion as a dominating reading mode in the discipline of comparative literature. She states that we must learn to recognize situations in which suspicion is not called for, but when a mood of admiration, love and care is more politically effective and useful. Instead of privileging theory, trusting it to reveal what the work is really about, such a mood starts in the question why. 
and gives priority to the concerns of the literary text, treating it as a work of philosophy. Rather than going out on a quest for hidden meanings, the scholar studies how the words and structures are used. Adopting Freshwater's ethical position, I propose a reading strategy that is loyal <coughs> with the experience of being repressed, muted, or in other ways censored, by being sensitive to the socio-historical situation of the author, making her experience or anticipation of being censored from a gendered position the nodal point around which the literary text is structured. The anticipation or negotiation of censorship is thus regarded as a generator of style which addresses censorious limitations. Furthermore, I suggest that the ethical position and the consequent reading strategy in complicity with the censored author asks for a reading mood of caring love which starts in the concerns of the literary text and which takes the specific censorious situation of the individual author into consideration. Women's writing in history deserves an attentive, sensitive reading which responds to the concerns of the texts and acknowledges the impositions and restrictions of normative regulating structures. In relation to excluded women writers, the loving, caring reading mode is often a reading against the grain of established narratives of literary history and evaluations. It is a reading mode that, in line with the hermeneutics of suspicion, adopts a skeptic attitude to set definitions and scholarly methods, suspecting them of being containers of a long-term temporal chain of censorious events. Consequently, while the literary text is read in a loving, caring mood, established extratextual extra structures are read with suspicion. The loving, caring reading strategy, which I adopt in reply to the concerns of Agrel Sreddad, starts in an empathic relational reading position. According to Sandra Lee Bartke, such a position would not mean a total emotional identification, but allow a certain distance to the individual whose situation is observed, and which shapes a response of feeling with another. Feeling with the protagonist of the play, I pay attention to the many descriptions of tactile sensations and also to melodramatic hyperbole, evoking the reader's memory of emotional and bodily experiences. Bronwyn Parry suggests that intensely intimate relations without personal encounters can be achieved through interaction with shared uh, with shared objects through the deep sentiments that these objects may embody or evoke. In accordance with Parry, I treat the Grails Reddard as an interface, creating a deep feeling of solidarity and connectedness with the author and the 19th century women who her protagonist represents, comparable to friendship in which experiences are shared and acknowledged. I will now turn to a very specific censorious situation in the late 19th century Sweden. The rhetoric of self-censoring and exposure in a grave's place respond to the moral and artistic restrictions and impositions of the aesthetics of idealism. It was acted out both as an author authoritarian intervention by theater managers uh, and as an institutional interference through the influence it had on playwrights' ways of composing plays. The Scandinavian late, late 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century are characterized by a paradigmatic shift, a plethora of aesthetic varieties of anti-idealisms, anti for example naturalism, challenged the late 19th century version of the aesthetics of idealism. 
Still, it held a hegemonic position, not only at the prestigious theater in Scandinavia, but in many European countries in the 1880s and until the mid-1920s when modernism reached the hegemonic position. The moral backbone of the aesthetics of idealism was basically the exponents of conservative, patriarchal, bourgeois values. In particular, these norms defended matters of decency. They were tied up to the artistic conventions which demanded didactic, uplifting qualities. Any playwright, male or female, was influenced by the aesthetics of idealism and more or less consciously related to it if they wanted their play staged at a prestigious theater. The moral content tightly connected to an ideal dramaturgy was decisive in the censorious task of literatures, literatures and theater managers when deciding what to stage and what not. In the 1880s, naturalism was regarded as a more or less direct representation of reality with the capacity of exposing the naked, non-mediated truth. Aided by naturalistic narratives, indecency threatened to cross the line between the intimate and the public spheres in both directions, bringing sensitive information about men's sexual behavior into the family and exposing the secrets of family life in public. Performances and plays that criticized or clashed with the theatrical norms and conventions supporting decency, including the prevailing gender norms and ideology of family and marriage, provoked strong emotional reactions in both reviewers and ordinary theater goers and readers. Banishment from the theatrical stages was the primary concern of failing the act of balancing on the edge of indecency, but also exclusion from bourgeois circles by social shaming. Naturalistic literature was, was thought capable of such a severe threat to society that it could have legal consequences. August Strindberg, for example, was prosecuted for blasphemy and risked being sentenced to jail for having questioned the Christian act of communion in one of his short stories. With her naturalistic plays, Agrel risked crossing, risked crossing borders bo both as a woman expressing ideas in public and as a dramatist exposing differences between the idealized image of marriage and its reality from women's points of view. As society, to a great extent, was structured by gender, the situation for men and women looked or for women authors looked different. It was more complicated and sensitive for a woman writer to appear in public than for a man. I claim that the uneven gender structure of the public space affected the author's dramaturgical and stylistic choices, and that these played an important part for sensorial judgments of decency. Alfilda Grell's contemporary female colleague, Anne Charlotte Leffler, shows her awareness of this in a letter to a friend. She writes that she finds Henrik Ibsen's A Doll's House immensely interesting but strange, and that this and it by all means would have been rejected by the Royal Dramatic Theatre had she written it. In order to defy the audience's taste like that, your name must be Ibsen, and the last sentence was a direct quote. Translated to English, of course. Leffler clearly experiences that the conditions for how to write a play is different for her than for her male elder colleague, and that she, as a woman, is acting from a more restricted position in the cultural field. The dramaturgy in Agrel's plays have been, has been evaluated as low-quality, melodramatic, and simply constructed pieces of indignation with stereotyped roles. This, in turn, has been regarded as a result of an inability or insecurity in how to compose a play. My reading against the grain of established literary history reclaims pejorative judgments of melodramatic stereotype roles and pieces of indignation, claiming firstly that these features do not indicate poor dramaturgical skills, but gendered responses to the institutional restrictions of the aesthetics of idealism. Secondly, by reading the play in an, uh, in an admiring, loving mood, 
to show how these features help building a dramaturgical construct in which female experiences of intimacy is communicated. Now I turn to the rhetoric of self-censoring and exposure in Rentat. In the heated revelation scene in the last act of Red Dead, which I described in the introduction of my speech, an ambivalence towards Viola's behavior is created. This is done by the other characters' negative reactions. Even Viola's supportive and loyal friend, Uncle Milde, who has given her a, the gift of money, is appalled at watching Viola scolding her husband and mother-in-law, and he condemns it. This enables an interpretation of Viola's merciless outburst as caused by meanness. The marriage has suffocated, I quote, everything that was noble and good, end of quote, in Viola. Depicting Viola as mean and emotionally unstable, letting even the characters who are her friends take a stand against her, against her outspokenness reduces the force of criticism in the fierce testimony of women's conditions in patriarchal marriage. The revelation scene can be perceived of as both a response to an institutional silencing in accordance with the aesthetics of idealism and as a subversive protest against it. It allows dual responses from the readers and the theater goers. Either Viola's outburst is perceived of as delivered from a woman in her right mind, finally able to speak the truth, or from a woman which is mean and emotionally unstable and whose words should not be trusted. In a traditional use, according to the aesthetics of idealism, the revelation scene would end the play and give the representative of virtue her due reward. The villains should either be punished or converted to the right moral track again, resulting in a reconciliation of the family and confirm that complying with the conservative bourgeois moral values brings success and happiness. Viola has the qualities of the virtuous heroine. She is good-hearted and right-thinking and also in a subordinated position, thus shaped for the audience to take sides with. But contrary to the heroines of ideal realism, she is punished by losing a son while her merciless mother-in-law and irresponsible heartless husband wins the battle when she signs over the money to Oscar. Viola can either be interpreted as fairly punished for her unwomanly behavior and uproar, but at the same time, the, the ambivalence shaped by the <coughs> traditional use of the revelation scene questions her punishment. This is underlined by her husband's Oscar regretfulness and Viola's friend's worries about her when she finally leaves the house. Furthermore, it is significant that the angry Viola does not come from an intact, respectable bourgeois family. She has married into such a family. The violation of sanctioned feminine behavior in Reddad is acted out by a daughter of a man who ruined his family and left his wife to bring up Viola on her own outside the bounds of the city. This background helps creating the dramaturgical position of the good-hearted but socially subordinated melodramatic heroine in dire straits, which an audience is meant to sympathize with. But Viola's behavior can also be explained by her being the daughter of an immoral man, which subdues the criticism of the play and adds to the judgment of Viola's behavior as indecent. The dramaturgy of ideal realism is negotiated in a way that offers the possibility of, interpretate, of interpretate, interpreting the play in accordance with the conservative, patriarchal, and bourgeois moral norms of the time. Simultaneously, it reveals thoughts and feelings that cross the restrictions of the aesthetics of idealism, and consequently, patriarchal norms of subservient femininity. Thus, it has the potential to please the conservative spectator and yet uh, address a complicit audience which can perceive the subversiveness of the play. By using established dramaturgical figures in an unconventional way, Agrell is able, in a sophisticated way, to communicate her critique of patriarchal bourgeois marriage and represent the experience of emotional deprivation without explicitly opposing the restrictions of the aesthetics of idealism. Now, let's move to the loving, caring reading mode of Agrell's play, which means that I choose 
to read the play subversively to the aesthetics of idealism, to expose the banished themes of, of intimacy. As I have mentioned, uh, Agrelle's play have been accused of having stereotyped roles, which has given them the pejorative label, label pieces of indignation. In my reading of Red Dead, in complicity with Agrelle's censorious situation, I considered these, the features causing this label to what I perceive as, of as the main concern of the text, namely to represent female experience of being deprived of intimacy in marriage. I look upon the creation of Viola as the good-hearted heroine in dire straits and her stereotyped antagonists as instrument for focusing the female protagonist, which is a dramaturgical condition for representing e emotional experiences. In the first act of Red Dead, we are introduced to Viola and her situation. She is quiet and seems troubled. Dressed in black, she sits close to the fireplace, staring into the fire, lost in thoughts. When her husband Oscar enters, he recalls Viola's behavior at the beginning of their marriage. When he came home early in the mornings after nights out with his friends, she used to sit at the window waiting for him, all red with crying and shivering with cold. She neither waits for him nor cries anymore. And Oscar thinks that, I quote, marriage has had a reposeful effect on Viola, end of quote. His comment ironically exposes Viola's silence and thoughtfulness and hints that something is wrong. Later in the first and second scene of the first act, Viola's lack of power and imprisonment in the marriage becomes obvious. Viola's task is to run the household, but she has to adjust to her mother-in-law's advice and the maid's neglect her orders. Her husband forgets about her birthday, and on top of this, she finds a picture of another woman which has slipped out of Oscar's pocket. Hyperbole, typical of melodrama, is used to depict Viola's situation, make it, making its precarity transparently clear, deepening our sympathies for the writer's kind-hearted protagonist. In combination with the stereotyped husband without any redeeming qualities, it invites the reader to adopt a solidary position close to Viola and to look at her husband and the whole situation from her perspective. By paraphrasing Sandra Libotki, the reader is asked to accept the invitation of feeling with Viola and to get upset on her behalf or according to the judgment in literary history to be indignated. Viola's freezing at the window and the warmth she seeks in front of the fireplace hints at the trouble causing her silence and depressed mood. She suffers in an emotionally barren marriage and longs for intimacy and care. The reference to the sensations of cold and warmth engages the reader's memory of tactile experience, thus creating an intimate relationship with the protagonist and ex the experiences her actions represent. The connection between the sensation of cold and warmth on the one hand and Viola's suffering and longing on the other thereby produces an embodied understanding of the experience of the miserable marriage in the reader. The hyperbolic melodramatic final scene works in the same way. Viola wears her black dress and a black veil, holding white flowers in her hand and carrying the dead son in her arms wrapped in a black shawl. Viola says she will leave to go to her mother's grave. She cries out in anguish and laughs hysterically. In accordance with Peter Brooks, melodramatic exaggeration points beyond the literal meaning. The dark colors with the Gothic tints convey Viola's emotional distress at its strongest in the very moment of experiencing it. Once again, the reader's or the audience's embodied memory is addressed to activate the sensations of wild despair which Viola feels over her dead son. By recalling sensations and sentiments in, in the reader, the experiential reading mood makes the play into an interface connecting the reader today and the late 19th century women whose experiences are represented. In line with Parry, the play embodies a relation of intimacy bridging the distance in time in which experiences can be shared 
and acknowledged. Now I will first conclude and then I will move to the transcultural contextualization. In relation to women's writing on intimacy, I have proposed a complicit reading strategy that acknowledges the censorious situation of the author. The style and rhetoric of the text is looked upon as a response to a such situation. In the case of Alfilda Grell's Reddad, I have shown that the restrictions and impositions of the aesthetics of idealism have produced a vacillation between censoring and exposure of the female experience of an emotionally barren marriage. It has produced two ways of interpreting Viola and the situation, in line with the aesthetics of idealism and its connected ideology, or subversively. I have furthermore suggested a reading strategy of women's writing in complicity with the author by exposing banished themes. This requires a skeptical attitude towards established scholarly literary methods, set definitions, historiographical narratives and evaluations, suspecting them of being links in a chain of censorious events. In contrast, the complicit reading strategy of the literary text is one in, loving and, is one in a loving and caring mood. This means privileging the concerns of the censored text over set definitions and historiographical narratives and over theories and study how words and structures are used in relation to this concern and the censorious situation of production. In Alfila Grell's Redda, this means an experiential relational reading mood as a reply to the concerns of the text. Melodramatic structures and stereotype roles are related to the exposure of the deprivation of intimacy in an emotionally barren marriage. The stereotype roles help constructing a dramaturgical position from which the emotional experience can be represented, inviting the reader to feel with the protagonist. Melodramatic hyperbole and references to sensations are perceived of as activators of the reader's tactile memory, creating an embodied, embodied understanding of the text. In this experiential reading mood, the play works as an interface, bridging the distance in time between the modern reader and the 19th century women whose experiences are represented. Margaret McFadden, oh sorry, I've spelled her name wrong, I see here. It should be without the H in Margaret. Margaret McFadden identifies avenues or domains of international woman to woman connectedness in the 19th century. She links them to the rise of the new commu communication systems. She includes traveling, bonds between women working in reform movements and in secular and religious utopian community movements. Networks of support, <coughs> affiliation and common purposes linking political revolutionaries, refugees and expatriates together. And the rise of celebrity cults which call into existence virtual communities. McFadden anchors the international community of women writers with shared commitments in the, author's, in the author's life, their being able to travel, they taking part in political societies and so on. Although some women writers did travel or lived in exile, a lot of women writers did not, not have the opportunity to meet over national borders due to legal, economic, social, national and cultural reasons. Still, they are connected by similar censorious situations as ideas on decency and the gender division of the public space all over Europe dictated what was appropriate for a woman to write about and in what form and style. Moreover, decency prescribed what parts of the public space a woman could, in could inhabit and on what conditions. Leaning on McFadden's uh, idea, which she, uh, the, the last one of her, her examples of, of women to women connectedness, uh, namely virtual communities and Paris idea of literary works as interfaces bridging not only temporal distances but also geographical ones. I propose treating women's writing as a virtual community of an international woman to woman connectedness by considering their writings as con transcultural interfaces of shared experiences of intimacy in a certain period of time. 
Uh, in 2020, as Katja mentioned, an intimacy and spatiality workshop in Gothenburg took place. The anthology Women Writing Intimate Spaces, which right now is in press, is the result of the workshop. It shows such a virtual international woman to woman connectedness. It spans women's writing of intimacy from northern, south and central European cultural fringes and minor language areas and reveal close affinities in the author's exposures of intimacy. There are similarities in the ways they treat intimacy in connection to the dichotomies of public and private, the home and outside, the countryside and the city, the national and the cosmopolitan. Furthermore, metaphors of being stifled, muted and trapped reappear, and so do utopian dreams of freedom in the form of green worlds, rural idols and ancient traditional forms of living together. A reading mood in loving care of women's writers' representation of intimacy would look different depending on the specific poetics of the work in question and by taking into consideration the different site and time-specific socio-sensorial situation of production in different parts of Europe. But it may expose shared experiences of intimacy due to women's similar social and cultural positions based on ideas of their bodies. Such an approach would show transcultural affiliations and common purposes among women writers, independent of whether they met in person or not, read about each other or read each other's work. It would include women writers who were not explicitly part of uniting reformist movement or had the opportunity to travel or were forced to live in exile. Anthony Giddens has found that alongside modernization has developed a view of intimacy as a transactional negotiation about personal ties between equal partners. In this form, intimacy holds the position of a large-scale democratization on the, in, on the interpersonal level, which Giddens links to, demo, to the democracy of public life. This development has mainly, by driven by, has mainly been driven by women, according to Giddens. And it should be 1992, uh, not 96. Um, a complicit a reading strategy taking the gendered sensorial situation of production into consideration, combined with viewing women's writing about love, marriage, mothering, friendship, adultery, sexuality, etc., as a virtual community, would not only show women writers' connectedness, it would also give the possibility to make visible how these women writers. Uh, at a large European scale, contributed to the development of democratization. Whether they explicitly were part of political movements or not, their literature have had the potential to influence readers' feelings and thinking of intimacy and slowly change discourses of intimacy. Such an approach would go beyond a traditional view of women's movement or as organized political work and manifestation peaking at certain periods of time. It would show women's contribution to the democratization of Europe and thereby to modernity as a long-term movement over centuries across nations and cultural areas. <laughs>